So hello everyone, um, just wanted to say a big welcome to um, the IGD's Champion of Change webinar. I hope you can all hear me um, and we're here today to give you an insight into the workshops um, that we ran this year. So if you didn't manage to attend one, don't worry as we'll be covering um, all the top tips and bits of information that were presented on the day. Just to let you know, we have a lot of information we're going to try and squeeze into this hour. So we will try and leave about five minutes for questions at the end. But do please send your questions throughout and any we don't get to, we will answer after the webinar. So for those of you who don't know IGD quite so well, IGD is an educational charity for the food and grocery industry that also undertakes research for the benefit of the public. And we've been running these events to help you and thereby help the public. And that's it, there's no catch. So we're gonna crack on now and start with the programme. So just to let you know, your speaker for today um, is myself. My name is Rachel Bradford um, and I've been working at IGD as their Nutrition and Scientific Affairs Executive. And I'm also joined by my colleague, Charlie Parker, um, who's the Interim Nutrition and Scientific Affairs Manager. We're both qualified nutritionists and worked in the food industry for a combined 24 years, Charlie, seven, Charlie 17 years and myself seven. Um, and we've worked through a combination of retail and manufacturing. We both bought, uh, joined the IGD team last year. So today we're gonna cover some of the challenges um, that companies face when they're undergoing reformulation. Last year, IGD undertook a company survey to try and understand these challenges and barriers and what we can do to try and help. Our survey showed from the 217 responses um, over manufacturing, retailing and catering and a lot of responses from SMEs that 76% had conducted some kind of reformulation, 8% had plans and others had positive reformulation feedback from customers where they had undertaken. Taste, consumer, texture, budget and technical were all key factors and challenges when reformulating. So our agenda for today, we're going to cover some understanding of your shopper, commercial opportunities and trends, nutrition environment, nutrition and health claims and technical challenges. So in this section, we will cover an overview of some of the key trends that you need to understand so that you can bring your shoppers with you on your reformulation journey. We know that it's very important that you appeal in the right way and to the right shoppers as you embark on reformulation to ensure its success. IGD has a big shopper research team and we engage with shoppers every day of the year, so we have lots of useful insights and data. These bits of data is from our Shopper Vista research of over 1,700 consumers and was conducted in April, May time this year. So first, we just want to highlight the importance of health ranging. The future of retail research focuses on where we think shoppers will be spending their money over the next five years. And we think a continuation of shopping little and often in smaller stores and online will continue. We see most growth coming from online convenience and discount. Small box retailing is increasing as consumers are looking to save time. But having said that, the bulk will still go through supermarkets, but this will reduce. So what are some of the key shopper truths? So here are some broad shopper trends. And in some sense, these are fundamental needs which shops are trying to fulfill when they go grocery shopping. And this is true whether it's in store or online. They're around value. How do they save money? How do they find the best value when they're grocery shopping? How do they save themselves time? And what's the best quality that they can get? And what factors are associated with quality? And the one we're going to be focusing on today is around health. So we know most people acknowledge the responsibility um, for their own diet as their own. Ahead of this, um, this is ahead of friends, family, GPs and industry. Over three quarters of shoppers agree that it's essentially up to them to follow a healthy, balanced diet. And this is significantly higher among 65 year olds and shoppers from a higher socioeconomic demographic. 
So this is good news for the industry, as most shoppers do accept responsibility and want to follow a healthy diet. So even though there's the will there, unfortunately, few shoppers have reached the pinnacle of healthy eating. Four in 10 from our research say that they are always or mostly healthy. But this means that the majority of people are having less healthy food on a regular basis. So from industry, this provides us a unique opportunity to make it easier for these shoppers to have a healthier diet. And it's important to remember that health means different things to different people. Our research showed that 85% of people are actively trying to improve their diet in some way. Eating more fruit and vegetables is the main way that shoppers are trying to improve their diet. But opportunities also exist for products which help shoppers support their desire to eat more fruit and vegetables, reduce their sugar intake and their fat intake, and which support their focus to eat a healthy, balanced diet. And also look at, when we look at the age groups, we can see that health priorities differ amongst these, with the younger groups looking at protein, families looking at fresh, and old people focusing on health and reducing nutrients such as salt. It's also important to remember that health is important for certain categories. So health overall is one of the top purchase drivers for shoppers, and it is claimed to be important. It does come behind other factors, but it's also up there. It's important to remember health is ranked differently in different categories, and it's more important for fresh and chilled food. Therefore, when you undergo reformulation in your category, it's important to take into account where shoppers place health for your category. It's also very important to know that there's a lot of work to do to rebuild trust. Six in 10 consumers believe that most food companies don't care if people eat healthily, and only 44% trust food companies provide all the products they require to follow a healthy, balanced diet. And a fifth of shoppers disagree with this statement. Health and nutrition claims need to be delivered with integrity so shoppers have confidence in them to inform them of their decision-making process when buying certain products. So demonstrate and enhance your health credentials on pack, on fixture and above the line communication and help drive greater shopper confidence in your product offering. We'll be touching on nutrition and health claims later on in the webinar. And finally, something we wanted to pull out from the data that's really important. The good news is, is that shoppers are increasingly open to reformulation. So from our survey from 2015 to 2017, we've seen the number of shoppers who are open to reformulation has increased, with the caveat being they're still as tasty. So it's important to manage the communication of your reformulation, as this will reassure shoppers that the new recipes do not compromise on product taste or quality. And it's also important to note that improving the nutritional profile of your products could drive greater shopper appeal. So now I'm gonna pass over to Charlie to cover the commercial opportunities and nutrition environment. Morning, everyone. So I'm going to start on touching on the commercial opportunities in health. The global sales of the healthy food market is estimated to reach one trillion this year. The category has some serious stamina. Consumer health is at the forefront of most retailers minds with vegan, natural and free from being the key buzzwords of 2017. The retailers and in turn the manufacturers that are winning are those that can be really nimble and are translating these trends into affordable products consumers want to buy. So here are a few of the big trends. So plants based milks over the last um, 10 years has been a phenomenal um, explosion with coconut overtaking soya milk in the last year and the market growing in excess of 155%. A staggering one in five households are now choosing to buy non-dairy plant-based products such as soya, rice, oat, almond and coconut. The free from category has been in incredible growth again as shoppers um, don't necessarily have a, a medical condition but are choosing um, to um, consume three from products um, as a lifestyle choice. 35% of shoppers now shop free from for their general health and wellness. And in the latest year, 65% of the UK population have bought from this fixture. 
this was a fixture that once was quite unloved um, in the retail sector. Moving on um, to a plant and avocado, um, for example, in 2016, Britain spent nearly 50 million on avocados, um, which is absolutely staggering. And the cauliflower has really had its year. It's become the new kale with a massive glut in cauliflower and it's featured as a hero um, in many out of home um, menus. Sales of coconut water are now almost 60 million. Um, with sales growth of 64% in the last year. And Coca Vita, Vita Coco, um, being one of the, the biggest um, brands in this area, has turned over $420 million worldwide with 50% of the market share. And the growth of natural and healthier snacking is illustrated by um, Naked um, brands' growth of 117% this year. So following the health agenda can really deliver against your bottom line. However, there are risks and implications of not following this agenda. And if we just look at the beverage market and take sugar as an example, um, looking at the sugar tax, if you are not tackling this, um, the implications for this market can be pretty catastrophic. And it looks like the um, levy is expected to reduce consumption um, by about 1.6 as consumers switch out of these into healthier choices. So we know the sugar tax is, is coming. Um, what is next? Will the government um, be introducing fiscal um, measures if sugar reduction isn't happening um, fast enough in other product categories? I'm now going to touch on um, some of these trends with a nutritionist verdict on them. So give you sort of the, the flip side of the trend. Um, so let's touch on plant power first. Um, the grocer recently reported a 17.2 million sales boost in meat free in the last year, with veganism becoming the fastest growing lifestyle movement. Um, and this previously has been very much for um, the, the steadfast um, vegan. Now it's becoming far more mainstream, um, very much a millennial type of um, market, whereas vegetarianism um, is still dominated by um, the female teenager. So the, the flip side of the um, this trend is if you are following it with um, it's well planned, it can be really nutritious, high in fibre, micronutrients, low in saturates and can lower the risk of certain diseases. However, if it's not well planned, um, it can be deficient in certain nutrients, protein, iron, calcium, vitamin D, B12, selenium and iodine. Um, and there are big sustainability um, issues for certain ingredients um, that are, are seeing a real boost um, on the back of this trend. And of course, the, a vegan diet, um, because it is so strict, can be risky for certain population groups, such as pregnant women, um, babies, toddlers and teenage girls. So the free from trend, you've, you've already heard um, what I've said about the increase um, in plant based milks and um, people switching into this lifestyle movement. Um, so if this again is well planned and it's under the supervision of a healthcare professional, it can really improve symptoms and improve um, well-being. However, it's not necessarily the, the healthier option and can lack certain nutrients um, if it isn't well planned, such as calcium, vitamin D um, and whole grains. Um, big watch outs for this is if you are going to put um, free from claims in your products, you may, must make sure they are validated and you're following the regulations. So sugar, the centre stage dietary demon at the moment, um, there's been an incredible amount of media noise around this um, and a lot of noise from um, celebrities endorsing the sugar free movement with cookbooks um, coming out left, right and centre. Um, and consumers are really interested in um, sugar. You could see from Rachel's slide earlier on, it is up there as um, one of the key concerns. People are looking to manage their sugar intake and choosing lower or no added sugar options. 
Um, but sugar is absolutely essential for life. The body requires about 160 grams of glucose a day. So turning to a sugar-free diet isn't um, the healthier option. So my, my watch out here for you is if you are going to be putting claims on products such as no added sugar or the no added refined sugar, you really need to make sure that these claims can be substantiated. And when you're reformulating a product, you need to look at it in a holistic approach, not just thinking about sugar as the only nutrient. And finally, on to fashionable health. So if you look at any clean eating aficionado shopping basket, you'll see many of these, these ingredients. It's cool to be seen eating a lot of these ingredients. Um, many of which have reputed health benefits, often traditional ingredients of certain cultures and countries. And they've been made cool by social media and celebrities, so-called health gurus. The trend is quite city centric, um, focused on the millennials. Um, and much of the growth of these ingredients has been driven by the sort of the SME market, those who are really nimble and perfectly placed to serve this niche market. And the proliferation of the smaller brands in turn has sort of increased consumer interest. However, some of these ingredients do deserve their spotlight. Nutritionally, they're great. Um, but as any nutritionist will tell you, it's all about moderation. Um, and um, there are sustainability issues with quite a lot of these ingredients. So if you take almonds, for example, 80 percent of the world's almond crop is coming from California, which is experiencing its worst growth uh, drought on um, record. And it takes five litres of water to grow just one almond. Or if you look at quinoa, um, it now um, the Bolivians and um, Peruvian, sorry, and Bolivians where um, quinoa is grown can no longer actually afford their own crop because um, the price has increased so dramatically because of the, the Western demand for it. So to summarise on this um, session, um, get a qualified nutritionist or dietitian um, to help you separate the, the wheat from the chaff. So these are just some of the key um, associations to look for um, if you want to work with a dietitian or nutritionist, just to make sure that you are getting someone with the right qualifications to help you. OK, I'm now going to move on to the nutrition environment. So starting um, with obesity and um, the associated costs. So human cost of obesity is huge. huge. It's associated with um, increased risk of a number of um, diseases and the financial cost is huge. 5.1 billion to the NHS in obesity, um, ill-related health. And the scale of the challenge is huge. About 25% of adults are obese, one in five children are starting school overweight and obese, and one in three are leaving school overweight or obese. And because of all of this, we've got a lot of government intervention, and there has been for many years, but most recently, we've had um, in 2016, the launch of the Childhood Obesity Plan, um, which aims to really tackle the problem um, and I'm going to take you through um, some of the detail of the childhood obesity plan shortly. But let's just first look at um, what a healthy diet should look like. Um, so the government um, Eat Well plate is um, an evidence based model which represents how we should be balancing our diets um, in the UK and what proportion we should have from each of the food groups. And you can see on the right how we um, are doing as a nation nutritionally. So we're eating too much sugar, saturated fat and salt, and we're not eating enough fruit, veg, oily fish or fibre. And I'm going to touch on that in a little bit more detail now. So sugar, we know, as I've already said, um, too much sugar increases energy intake, increases um, the risk of dental decay and sugar sweetened beverages increase the risk of diabetes and weight gain in children and adolescents. Um, we've had the SACAN report um, which detailed the amount of sugar that um, we should be reducing the diet to so we should be having um, free sugar should not exceed 5% of total dietary energy whereas currently we're up at near a sort of 12%. Um, and what do we have from the government on this? Well, we have new sugar guidelines and the sugar levy 
which I'll touch on in a second. Um, what, does, what do we look like um, in terms of salt intake? Um, well, we know um, too much salt increases blood pressure, risk of heart disease and stroke. The um, recommendation is six grams a day for adults, but current intakes are at about eight grams. And we've got um, voluntary salt reduction targets from the government for this. Um, with saturated fats, um, there are implications um, for heart health and the um, dietary recommendations are less than 11% of dietary energy, which translates to about 20 grams a day. Currently, we're um, over this at about 12.7. And um, next year, um, the SACN um, Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition will be reviewing this and um, coming out with some recommendations. So watch this space. And of course, don't forget about calories. Um, so we should be focusing on um, these three nutrients that we need to reduce in the diet. Um, and you also need to be considering um, overall um, your um, calories. Um, but also important to remember fiber, fiber day and oily fish, because it's easy um, to forget with the amount of coverage there is um, on sugar reduction. Um, that these three areas we need to be increasing as well. So um, the SACN report um, stated that fibre should increase to 30 grams a day and current intakes are um, around 18 grams. So we're well below where we need to be. Um, five a day recommendations, um, about 27% of the population achieving this. And interestingly, teenagers the worst um, with intakes similar to that of toddlers. Um, and oily fish, um, the recommendation is about 140 um, grams a, a week, but current intakes are around 56, so well below where we where we need to be. And um, advice on this um, that sits alongside the Eat Well plate is we should be consuming two portions of fish a week, one of which should be oily. So now touching in a bit more detail on the childhood obesity plan. Um, so there were 14 recommendations in this, and I'm just picking out um, the three sort of biggies for the food industry here. Um, the first was on reformulation, which had a real focus on sugar. Um, the second was the sugar tax, and the, um, the third was labelling of sugar in, in products. Alongside this, there were various um, other recommendations, um, of which I'm not going to um, focus on today. I just really want to focus um, on firstly on the sugar. Um, so um, following the, the launch of the report in March of this year, um, Public Health England brought out um, sugar reduction guidelines. This covered um, nine um, food categories that contribute the most sugar to children's diet. Um, and they're currently looking at expanding this to another category um, of milk based drinks. Um, Progress will be reviewed at 18 and 36 months. They've asked for a 5% reduction in the first year, which was um, we've gone past. That was August um, of this year and a 20% reduction by 2020. Um, the targets are um, that the guidelines are given as a sales weighted average and there are also um, calorie um, limits um, for certain categories as well. And there are three approaches to achieve the guidelines. One is reformulating to reduce the total amount of sugar. One is to reduce the portion size um, or the number of calories in a single serve. And the third is shifting consumer purchase towards the lower or no added sugar um, options. Onto the sugar, the, sorry, the salt targets. Um, these were first developed in 2006 and have um, been evolving and, and getting lower. Um, we've got um, targets for 72 categories um, and they're set um, by categories. Um, there are sales weighted averages and maximum targets. Um, and um, we've had actually really good progress in um, people achieving these targets, which has brought the population um, salt intake down. Um, so the food industry have done a massive amount um, of work in this area and the government have run really successful um, consumer education campaigns. You can see Sid the Slug there, um, which was some years ago run campaign run by the Food Standard Agency very successfully. So sugar and salt um, I've covered calories 
are likely we're going to have some um, targets coming out next year at some point from Public Health England and we will have saturated fat targets um, potentially coming out at some point um, in well in 2018 once the, the second report um, has pre produced so it's important to remember although a massive amount of focus is being given on sugar reduction right now you need to consider it as part of um, wider reformulation so the industry has an essential role to play there's an opportunity to help consumers improve diet without consciously modifying food choices so this sort of stealth health versus overt a positive impact on product reformulation by the food industry has already been seen in the UK and I've, I've um, talked about that in terms of um, sort targets. However, obesity rates are still unacceptably high and there's still some work to be done. Other direct and indirect actions by industry guiding consumers to healthier choices will also be important. The government's childhood obesity plan sets out actions for sugar reduction, including reformulation of key products, as well as encouraging reduction in portion size of higher sugar and calorie items. And whilst media often focuses on the single nutrient issues such as sugar, we should remember that the relationship between diet and health is multifactorial. The overall dietary pattern is absolutely key. I'm now going to hand back over to Rachel, who's going to cover nutrition and health claims. Thank you. So we're going to skip over this section because obviously there's a lot to cover, but it's basically the highlights that we wanted to pull out from the day. So the main regulation covering nutrition um, labelling is the food information for consumers, which outlines the mandatory elements that you must follow. This was implemented back in 2014 um, for most of the products, so it is out there and we should know about it, but it is one that we should always refer to. The Department of Health have also created a guidance document if you choose to display um, front of pack nutrition information. A note from IGD as well, we've been two years in the making of two um, labelling guides to help the industry. Um, they are free to download from our website. The two reports aim to do different things. So the first one that you can see on the top right um, is aimed to drive better consistency in the way that front of pack nutrition information um, is communicated to consumers. So we know it's on a lot of products um, and coverage is really good at the, in the mo at the moment in the UK. But what we really want to do is help consumers understand those messages so they can utilize them and help make healthier food choices. The second one on the bottom right is our best practice guide, which is currently in development. And this will um, give you a series of recommendations of how to present and how to um, display the front of pack um, lozenges. So we'd really recommend that if you are an industry and using this on front of pack, that you look at our guidance. Um, as I said, it can be found um, and downloaded free on our RGD website. It's also important to remember that we do have wide coverage, as I've mentioned, in the UK and it is present on a lot of products. But there has been a recent call out by NGOs such as Cash drawing attention to mainly premium brands that do not display, display front of pack information. And it has been highlighted that they believe that it's um, sorry, deceiving for consumers as they won't be able to see how some potentially high sugar and fat products um, are on the market and consumers don't have visibility of this through traffic light labelling. So when we look at nutrition and health claims, there's one regulation that you need to look at um, and this outlines um, the rules and regulations that you must comply with um, and this is applicable to all types of marketing. So this outlines the conditions of use that you need to um, adhere to when you are making a nutrition or health claim. When looking at nutrition and health claims, the, the, sorry, the conditions of use are laid out in the regulation and they must be followed. Nutrition claims are basically content claims when you're pulling out a certain nutrient um, to say it is a source of, contains or is high in that nutrient. Health claims are linking a nutrient um, to health. So it's pushing the um, a health benefit of a certain product. And then we also have non-specific health claims, which are the general goodness, um, healthy, good for you, wholesome superfoods. 
These are also implied claims, making the consumer think that this, these food products are better for you. And there are um, conditions in the regulations that you must follow in order to make these claims. And it's not just about complying um, with the regulation and making sure you get it right. If you get it wrong, it can be damaging to your brand. Um, the Advertising Standards Authority, the ASA, are responsible for um, investigating um, any complaints that are made. And there are just some examples here. And there's, there's been many more that have either been investigated and upheld um, or not upheld. And it's important to remember that it's not just consumers and local um, authorities that are looking at these products and making their complaints um, where the regulation has not been followed. It's also competitors. And this can lead to quite public um, public viewing of the claims and what's been followed and where the regulations aren't compliant. So now just a brief overview of the technical challenges. Um, there's different uh, strategies that you need to deploy for different categories. So obviously, depending on what product you're making, that you need to think which is most relevant for you. So the next few slides are really to prompt your thinking. So first, we'll look at sugar. It's important to remember that um, you can't just remove the sugar. It's not that simple. The most obvious attribute of sugar is sweetness, but sugar also works at a much more basic level. It interacts with other ingredients and alters the very structure of the product. It delivers preservative qualities, which can impact on shelf life. It provides bulk, texture, visual appeal, and aeration in some products. We know that sugar also provides gold standard for sweetness. Going back to the texture, it provides the structure, either soft, hard, brittle, chewy, crispy, or crunchy. It also provides volume through the bulk, through different ingredient interactions, and creates visual appeal through colouring. So how can sugar be reduced? It's hard to reduce the amount of sugar in food without creating unwanted consequences. And this is one of the biggest challenges currently facing the food and beverage industry. One option which has been much discussed in the media is reducing portion size in a process often referred to as shrinkification. While this might seem quite straightforward, it can have huge impacts um, on the manufacturing and create many challenges, as you have to often reconfigure fa the factories, the packaging and the distribution process in order to achieve it. Alternatively, manufacturers have been looking at product reformulation, and this is typically a long process. It's experimenting with different types of substitutes and proportions to try and arrive at the product that's both acceptable to consumers and works technically. The difficulty with this approach is that it can be time consuming, costly, and it's not without its risk. But the important thing to remember is it can be done. So look at what has been achieved for your product categories. Important one to note is also sweeteners. When replacing sugar with sweeteners, the product developer has to consider the impacts of a replacement on all of the properties above. They need to assess whether the reformulated product will be acceptable to the consumer, to the regulatory environment and to the retailers, as factors such as shelf life might be affected. Public Health England endorsed EFSA's scientific opinion on sweeteners as safe to use and acceptable alternative to sugar. And it's important to remember that one single sweetener cannot replace all sugar functions and typically a combination has to be used. Going back to the point of consumers, sweeteners, both from um, a perception um, as well as a taste point of view, can be very polarising. So bear in mind your consumer when you're looking at using sweeteners. Moving on to salt. Salt, once again, has many functions within food and it's not just a simple process to remove it. Salt stimulates salivation at higher concentrations. It creates fullness and thickness. It can also create a sweet taste at lower concentration and can suppress bitterness. It also has a huge impact on shelf life and processing. So all of these challenges need to be taken into consider when you're reducing or removing salt from your product. There's many ways we should reduce salt and we've been working on this as an industry for a long time. So lots of techniques um, have been used. Some, for example, and the one um, that Charlie's mentioned earlier, the great work the industry's done is via stealth. 
So just removing the total amount of salt bit by bit as people's taste will gradually get used to the lower salt content and then that will be their preferred. You can also change the microstructure of salt. You can create hollow salt crystals, which means that they still get the salty impact um, on taste, but there isn't as much salt content as the crystal is hollow. You can also change the distribution on the product. If you look at either layering or putting salt on just the outside of the product and not the inside, it will still give the salty taste when eating, but will have lower salt concentrations. Moving on to fat. Fat, once again, has many functions um, within the product from melting point, creating emulsions and obviously mouthfeel, which is really important to consumer enjoyment, the taste and the sensation they have when they're eating the product. Once again, many fat reduction strategies have taken um, place over the years. Um, it's important to remember when you are replacing, reducing or removing that you don't replace it with sugar. To Charlie's point, we want an overall calorie reduction and we gradually want to reduce these nutrients so consumers get used to the new healthier products. You can obviously replace fat with unsaturated fats, but be obviously aware of texture changes. And it might also cause um, challenges within the factory with flow and processing. Also think outside of the box, how can you reduce fat? Not either just by making portion size, but can you remove some of the higher fat elements in your products? For example, crustless pies and quiches, less cheese or the amount of sauce that you're using. And it's really important, and we've mentioned this before, that the product still tastes just as good. And the consumers need to accept the healthier product in order them to eat it and have a benefit. And we've seen some great examples at IGD of where um, companies have reduced um, certain nutrients in their products and consumers actually have preferred the taste. So it's tasted better for them. There's many factors and elements that you need to take into consideration when you're measuring consumer acceptance. And it's something that every product should go through when you are reformulating to ensure the consumers still love the great taste. There's many tests that you can do and um, depending on the desired outcome and what you're trying to measure. So we recommend that you speak to an organisation who specialises in consumer tasting. Some of the issues um, with consumer tasting are raised above. As part of our reformulation journey, we've been looking at other case studies that companies have done, um, looking at products by their challenge or the focus of the reformulation. So we'd really encourage you to go and look on our website and look at the case studies that we have on there, as you'll see some great examples over many categories um, of reducing several nutrients. And we really want to share best practice and share the challenges and barriers that other companies have overcome so that you can learn from them and look at some of the ways that they've achieved this. We're also looking for new case studies. So if you're a business that has undergone any reformulation and you've got a great example that you want to share, please do contact us because we can, IGD, we can share this um, and promote some of the great work you're doing because we know there's lots going on. So we've done a whiz stop tour here. Um, we've covered a lot and um, we're aware it's an overview and it is very broad. But we really just wanted to get you thinking about your products and how you can look at healthier reformulation, um, maybe some challenges that you've experienced, if there's anything that we can share at IGD that we've learned from other companies. And it's also important to remember, even though we've talked about reformulation in the form of reducing, um, replacing nutrients and reducing portion size, there's other things in industry that we can be doing. So looking at develop, developing new, healthier SKUs and line extensions, or maybe even an acquisition to a brand to encourage healthier eating. If you're a retailer, look at product placement, look at the location in store and your ILNs. What do you do promotions on? Maybe look at shifting the sales towards healthier alternatives. And this all counts towards um, targets like the sugar targets. And finally, look at marketing and remembering what the consumer sees and the touch points that um, they have contact with. And how can you do this responsibly and make sure that consumers have visibility of healthier options? 
So finally, I'd like to thank all the speakers um, and presenters who came to our workshops, including the BNF, Leatherhead Food Research, Camden BRI, Purple Basil, and our hosts um, over the five workshops, which were Waitrose, Co-op, Morrison, Sainsbury's and McDonald's. Without your expertise, we wouldn't be able to um, have done these. So I'd like to thank you all for listening. Um, I'd also encourage you to look um, at the IGD Health Eating page where we do have a lot of free resources um, across our health eating programme. We do also have a Twitter page that we encourage you to follow and a newsletter that we release quarterly from the health eating programme. So please do keep in touch with us and follow what we're doing and we would love to hear from you. So that wraps us up. We've finished a bit quicker as we've um, rattled through that. So if anyone's got any questions, please do feel free to enter them um, into the chat section on your computer. OK, we've got none coming through, so we assume everyone's happy unless we hear anything in the next minute or so. If not, you do have our healthy eating email address, so please do feel free to contact us. We have recorded this session, so we will be putting it online um, at a later date. So if you have any colleagues who you think this might be relevant to or useful to, please do direct them to that or do get in touch if you have any further questions. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>